Or maybe let's actually discuss it, just a couple of remarks. I think it's going to be the Q&A session for the participants of the discussion. Well, in, in terms of these small things in the context of which Andre just said, I don't even want to comment it just to not, not even want to recall what is the retail tax or whatever it is or VAT. We had a lot of argument about this. And the question, I still remain to be confident not in VAT. I think the turnover tax will create more than 60% of all the total revenue, so we cannot replace one tax by another. Not, we are not replacing a big tax by the dozen of small ones, but this is to be a quality replacement given all the constraints that a VAT administration is all about and has. And there are a lot of different schemes to take to wash out VAT from the budget and to make it great. It's a typical way for Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. And even for Italy, which seems to be in the European Union, it has very serious constraints about administering the tax. Whenever there is demand for such a people who will, who will be involved in the reforms, so I think will, they will have to make an analysis and will be able to choose uh, among one or two major solutions. As for uh, Mr. Ilarionov's uh, remark of 17 or 19 percent, after you describe the patient, I think we need to be protected from external aggression. I think 15 to 17 can only be done if we say to 14 million pensioners in Ukraine, okay, guys, right now you stand alone. You're on your own. If politically this decision is possible, because economically that's fine. There is a model that made in a, a conclusion like this. If you want to maximize economic growth potential, then go ahead. And there are institutions that still deliver services to protect uh, ownership rights of the state. If nothing is there, then we are speaking about the transitional period to cut the uh, uh, government jobs. You know that in Singapore this 18.5%. In many uh, Southern Asian countries, the share of today's public expenditures does not exceed 20%. But they started from 10 to 12, and when the country moves from 53 down to 17 over, over a couple of years or a couple of months, then I'm afraid all the presidents of the European Union, U.S., and ourselves will not be able to rescue the Ukraine's leaders from the potential response. So strategically, the figures that were described, what can be done actually since 2015, without any big major stress, because the, the state shows where the resources will be allocated to. We can be talking about the money from uh, switching the economy from gray to white and eliminating corruption, because this is inevitable. And at the end of the day, when, when we have all the reforms ready, even the army reform, Larissa studied Georgian experience actually. How much time would we need to actually launch the reform to realize how much money will be necessary for the police, prosecutor's office, and courts in the new system of well-trained people, and as well as the army? Like I said, I showed you the percentages that we really need to build the army from scratch, from grassroots, and this requires a lot of money. It's not only, not only, not only about technical assistance, but also resources that will have to be accumulated. So I want to emphasize it once again. What we're talking about right now, we're talking about practical solutions that provide for the available customer. What Andrei just said was that this is a very important thing. That we cannot yet see the political expert environment or customer that would be our vis-a-vis. -vis. And Mr. Ilariona would come and say, like to Kaha. Okay, guys, let's sit down and discuss from what we have, from what you ordered, what kind of menu you want for the reform, VAT or no VAT, with special pension fund or without the pension fund. But you know the menu, but we are not even in a restaurant. We cannot read the menu because we are not even in a restaurant. So this is a question probably not to economists that, that much, but to the mindsetters. When there is demand for reform here in Ukraine, how civil society can get involved and those people who, will, who feel this pain for Ukraine. Larissa, I can say 
something as well. Speaking about reforms in Ukraine, we have to uh, keep in mind that there is no uh, special way because there will be just different uh, variables in the equa equation because there is a war and uh, this economical situation is not. I will not provide economical advice because a lot has been said. I would like to shift the focus from purely economical formulas to um, how you can explain it. Neither in our post-Soviet countries nor in European countries, it's not impo it's not possible to win the elections. It doesn't mean that you don't have to have these reforms, but you have to build your strategy in a different way. But reforms, uh, corruption reforms, can be a key reform because they fight against corruption in every way. And this is where the interests of the right wing and left wing meet. But um, setting goals during fighting corruption, you can uh, implement these reforms that are required, like fighting corruption by privatizing large enterprises, you cut uh, expenditures uh, on pro uh, public sector ex expenditures, and you, you should view this problem from different angles and work not only by arguments of uh, economical liberalism, but a series of other factors. Econom econ economy is about our lifestyle, and you can have different views on that. And in order to communicate to people, to reach the public using just um, economical liberalism arguments is very important, it's very hard, but it's necessary. Now, Vladimir, I would like to, su to support it, this idea. In, um, it's absolutely agree that Ukraine needs uh, years of uh, rapid economical growth to be an independent state. Because as you know that the GDP is one-fourth of the Russian GDP in dollars, according to the nominal rate. But this gap in uh, level of economical development is a, it undermines the Ukrainian uh, state because a lot of people uh, they are negative about it and they um, think that the Ukrainian project is will fail. And uh, it's, but it's the only way to fight this inferiority complex. And 17% of GDP is a strategical, strategic goal that you have to follow in a three years perspective is absolutely right. Speaking about Maidan, I had a different feeling. I didn't have a feeling that there are lots of pro-reform and uh, slogans like let's go for Bendu kids uh, and, and other people, which means lots of people when they're not uh, not based on populist slogans, but in order to uh, put up with this uh, hard situation, they were ready to risk their freedom and even their lives. So 
I think Ukrainian society are more ready for reforms than those people who are on the top of the government and the result of the parliamentary elections show that because if you compare it with the slogans of the party, party slogans of the 2012, it's it's not that populist now. And three non-populist parties, pro-European parties of one. The question is how their leaders will, what their leaders will do with their uh, powers. What parties? Poroshenko, Yatsenyuk, and Sadovy bloc. Unfortunately, Ukrainians were not given for ideological parties. These are just a uh, project of their leaders. And uh, this configuration is not long term because the Ukrainian society is more. Uh, more mature than the political parties they represent them and more ready to for the reforms than those who accidentally found themselves in power. And when we discussed uh, uh, the name of this panel with the organizers, I had this, uh, my slogan, a word, and Kahabinukidze told me that uh, the happy state when uh, Ukrainian is independent. And, and is free, and uh, you know the meatballs are not flying into your mouth. So that, that was my my slogan, my my idea for 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 the name of this panel. Ukrainians as workers, they not worse, and sometimes even stronger than their colleagues in Moscow. More motivated, more ready to invest into their jobs in more ready to risk, take risks. And from my experience, I should say that Ukrainians, as soon as uh, radical economical reforms will be implemented, they are ready to work hard to be successful and to make the country successful. Thank you. Andrei. Uh, do you have anything to say? Okay, let's um, start our Q&A session. I will start my, uh, with my uh, question. And what Andrei talked, sorry to talk about, about monetary policy of Ukraine, what National Bank of Ukraine is starting to do. They are trying to support the Krivna. How should we reform the central bank? And Kahabit Nukadze was a great opposer of uh, central bank in small countries, and he couldn't do that. Yaroslav? Um, I don't support central bank, and I'm a supporter of a golden standard, but you need a tr transition period. And uh, uh, as for the practice demonstrated by Ms. Gontareva, you have to uh, implement currency competition and to understand what Ukrainians are choosing. On these territories, central state does not should not have exclusive right to print money. It will allow to develop private money, and we'll see what the central bank can, can offer. 
for Hryvnia. Any other uh, options like currency corridor or free float? If we're talking about perspectives, what Dimmer talked about, I would offer as part of these brave reforms the solution, offer the solution it would be a preventive solution. Andre, do you want to say something? Because I really want to listen to your opinion. If you tell me about it. The previous speaker, I mean Larissa, mentioned one of the key uh, approaches used by Georgian reformists. She calls it parasiting or benchmarking. Benchmarking, benchmarking is quite, it's not really clear, but and parasiting is has a negative connotation. And Bandekids insisted that uh, the same technique is used, or let's say copying other institutions. And there are two options. Euroization or dollarization um, means giving up a national currency. In this case, your car, uh, central bank tr tr is starting to finance the lack of budget or currency board. When nominally you have hryvnia, but it is linked to the external anchor, so you don't need any institution like central bank. So this is my point. Andre, Larissa. Normally, Andre has a good job finishing any idea, so I will speak first. What Kaha did in Georgia? It's a very good question. So he wanted to dissolve the central bank in Georgia, but he failed. And the step of economical freedom he mentioned, he limited central bank and limiting it to certain indicators it should demonstrate. If you fail, it doesn't mean you have to follow all the time. Sometimes you can mask your activities and this radical solution on um, uh, dissolving central bank can be more negative than positive. What happened with anti-monopoly service in Georgia and Kaha dissolved it, destroyed it, and then he regretted it because European Union likes names, like good names. And just having this function, minimizing this to some certain clear procedures can, can solve many problems in communicating with Europe. In the situation when Ukraine wants to be part of Europe, of course, politically correct is to harmonize the interaction with Europe to avoid problems. In Today's Europe will not support the liquidation of the central bank. Thank you. You see, uh, well, just for you to understand the scale of a problem, recently the current head of the National Bank of Ukraine said that they lack 800 million dollars from the reserves of na na National Bank, and they don't know what, where they are. What, what does she mean? It probably happened recently. It's like we, we, we can't find it. We, we lost this money. And in this situation, I'm surprised by these words and but the lack of discussion. What happened? Because the sum is not just a golden 
golden pile of Meja Giryov, a former president. president. Because if it happened recently, well, this year it's absolutely unprecedented thing. That this is an institutional problem. And the question here to discuss needs a personal and institutional solution. And my colleague mentioned it. The, what Kaha did. He had this extraordinary view on ordinary events. He, he saw how what inflation rate countries have in the long term, like hundreds of years, where countries had their national currencies. And when you, when you collect these statistics, you see absolutely clear picture. Kaha liked to show there are nine currencies in the world, which you can call stable, that are absolutely convertible, and they are trusted. All other currencies, almost 200, are failures. That result in uh, redistribution from a public sector to uh, pockets of thieves. Only nine currencies. So the question is, what is, what is the chance that in one country, Georgia, Russia, or Ukraine, is able a tenth currency that in the next hundred years will have uh, inflation, not more than two percent will be convertible for all operations and have the same trust as, as they say, uh, a dollar is a dollar. And if you don't have this 100 years where you want to have these experiments, you probably need to uh, use a success story. And uh, during a transition period, you have to do a currency work to link a national currency with all relevant institutions to one of the world currencies. And since Ukraine wants to be part of euro, it should be a euro. You don't have to focus on this step, maybe to uh, switch to Euroization, just borrow Euro. You don't have to ask Kiev, Moscow, Brussels, just use it, just like Montenegro. They were not part of any institution and they're just using Euros, what Frankfurt or Brussels do against that, nothing. Because the taxi driver, they accept euro, no. And why should you invent the wheel? Dollars are also accepted. Someone accept uh, Swiss francs. Should we do multi currency? And people who support a golden standard, and people said yeah, that in this case. 0.5% inflation, even comparing to a historical period, will we'll show you where to go. The transition period is a choice of a person, of, of citizens, not a bureaucrat. And it will be more another situation that will lead into a 1997 crisis in Asia. 
So when the, it's, it's, it's up to discussion on an expert level, but in perspective, that money should cease to be uh, just a paper. And there's another thing I, I want to hear, and you, 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 you remember this slide with reform plan in Georgia. And Ukrainian plan took more words, pages, and I wonder if it has more had more content. And could you, Vladimir, could you comment on your Facebook post about the uh, re reform plan? Yeah. There is a point in it uh, that cabinet of ministers should approve five-year uh, plan to fight the uh, road accident victims. And 80% of this agreement is absolutely use useless. I can say the following. Yanukovych's reform program introduced in 2010 is more effective than this current reform plan. And I really hope that people who sit here and people who walk in the street will not tolerate tolerated that uh, the best from the worst are destroying the countries because they should as we can see uh, concrete requirements they do work uh, the most disgusting resolution of the aviation service adopted by the former uh, International Ukrainian Airlines Associate after there was a lot of reaction from civil society and economists seems not to come into force anymore. And it is very important right now for the society to realize that democracy is not something one-off that you can vote, go vote once for four or five years in, in the Ukrainian agenda today. This is an ongoing, very thorough, competent monitoring of those calamities done by the generated by the government right now. And this is the, what I the biggest hope of mine. And let's switch to the best of the best questions, or worst from the best. I have such a question. Andrei Larionov said that the currency and gold reserves, as Gontario is getting rid of them with the huge pace, I have another three months remaining before the default. Do you believe that a default is inevitable and won't get away from it? If it is, then how it is better to put more straw for soft lending? I can't remember any cases in the past when the country would face a default inability to repay commitments with when the same government remained in office. So there's a question, maybe we should spend these three months in order to select the right people who will be trying to make the situation better after Yasinuk's government. Thank you. So first of all, inevitable or not, I, I didn't say it was inevitable. If the policy will remain to be the same, that's one. Number two, in case the reserves will be reducing even more, $4 billion a month. This is just an ex a presumption, because there were some specific conditions in the last month that I don't want to talk about again, but 
if we see that the reserves will melt the way they do right now and no measures ta are taken there too, then it will be inevitable, for sure. This is just a technical arithmetical calculation without any, there is no rocket science here. And if some action takes place, I mean, personal commitment, institutional endeavors, political things, then this can be avoided. As for the straw for soft landing, this is the straw. Just realizing that what we want, or you want, is the default, or you not want, or you don't. So here is a question. I have an impression, it may be in response to your third question already. You were saying that has it always been the case that default normally triggers resignation of government? Not always, but very often. In follow-up of the default, in most of the times, the president resigns. And maybe those who are involved in uh, policies not paying attention to reality, to the coming catastrophe, I think that's the case, and this government will have to leave. But personal changes that are triggered by this political crisis can be pretty much different than it's normally expected. Am I, am I clear in that, clear enough? I just want to add that sometimes the default leads uh, the loss of uh, statehood. Ask the Scot Scottish people about the end of the 18th century. They still not, they're still not unable to overcome this irresponsible uh, social policies. I mean, this is economic crisis and de economic default and political crisis. I think some other forces will take advantage of the situation and what kind of appetites they will have, the other people will have, what kind of conditions they can accept to what they're going to take in terms of territory, in terms of the Ukrainian assets, I mean the gas transit system uh, or anything else. There are not silly people People over there, they keep close eye on what's going on in, 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 in here and they have big major interests. So if we think that that's the only final, then we are in deep. This is a big mistake. Good afternoon. I have such a question. This very complicated forecast and the fact that our government is not considering the today's agenda as critical, are there means or best practices from other countries to put that question without waiting for this to happen, without waiting for the catastrophe in front of us, except for our traditional Maidans like we've had already? I think that's a question to the audience. Well, you already, you have free media, you have civil society that's being very active. If people start ask, asking questions, why you guys are not doing anything with the economy, why you still stagnate, why you allow this to happen when you start articulating how much money Ukraine is losing because of this reluctancy, then the people will uh, realize the loss of profit, I mean, potentially, when Mr. Bolsarovich in Warsaw and they have this debt meters and how much each American or each Polish person is owing to. If you calculate how much Ukraine loses every day because Yatsenyuk and Poroshenko are not doing any reform, you can use different means in order to knock on the right doors to make people listen to this, that we need to take care of the economy. They say, no, first the war, let's fix that, and then we'll turn to the economy. There's a feeling like Ukraine has only 500,000 people, like in Liechtenstein, Liechtenstein. There are resources and resources for the army, and of course there has to be resources for the economy. In the army, seems there is something going on, some people are doing something, I can't ju justify whether it is positive or ne negative, but I can cannot help agree with my colleagues here. I also wanted to add, when Kaha died, I had such an idea that maybe this death did much more damage to Ukraine than if the Russian aviation would bomb presidential administration in Ukraine and the governmental, uh, governmental building. Because Kaha in the last nine months has, has spent a lot of effort and energy in order to enlighten Ukrainians by telling them about the situation where, where the Georgians ended up in. And I think this work was not in vain. Maybe some do dozens or hundreds of people who listened to, to him would wake up 
and the favorite very strong Kaha's metaphors because he wouldn't mind speaking from the stage like you guys just do not understand what kind of asshole you entered I think it was a job not in vain and I think it lays a good foundation for very sober thinking and understanding of what has to be done after the inevitable process will actually expire and finish and the elites will rotate and change, be changed by the new elites. What has to be done to accelerate? We need to self-organize. We need to set groups create pressure groups, maybe new um, political parties. There is also another solution. Can you imagine such a so, such an initiative group? Vakarchuk, Ruslana, the singers, and then your Orthodox Patrick, and also some uh, public opinion leaders, and they demand market reforms to begin. So that we need that uh, this voice has to be very persuasive, that people make will make people wake up. What have we been doing for the last year? Just we collect. Uh, we have to collect uh, major opinion leaders. Vakarchuk is inspire, inspiring people. Ruslana also inspires people. The patriarch. I mean, not those technocratic people, no bankers or business people, but these people, popular ones, to call upon responsibility from politicians and commitment. Thank you. Between listening and hearing, there, there is a big difference. Unfortunately, our Maidan could not be converted effectively into a positive energy that could trigger this process in Ukraine to build a prosperous and successful future. We couldn't have converted that. Why is that? Because our politicians did not want to listen up to Maidan, and our Maidan, unfortunately, could not tell why they were there in the streets. So when I talked to my friends who were actually one of the opinion uh, leaders in Maidan across Ukraine right now, they are members of parliament, and they told me, Let's ask people why they went to Maidan. Let's come to the students and say, what kind of change would you want? What do we have to do for this country to develop and evolve? Let's ask medical doctors or maybe other people, business people. You say, wait, wait, wait a minute. We will kick Yanukovych out, and then we're going to be in Europe, everything will be all right. But unfortunately, third, around 70% of Ukrainians never traveled abroad, but to Egypt, Turkey, Belarus, and Russia. When we were speaking about Europe, even sometimes we say, I want to sell an apartment for sale, European refurbishment. Why does it call European? It's just good standard refurbishment. Unfortunately, we haven't converted this Maidan into something, into some energy. And of course, okay, in each of our sectors, we need reforms, but there is no. I have a concrete question. We cannot start the economic reform. Why don't we start the economic reform from the pension reform? Our pension system is an Argentina type. I mean, South American type of system, because I've been dealing with the pension reform for years now. If you want to do the pension reform out of the tax and budgetary reform, then you're going to fail. Experience has shown that if you're doing this accumulating system or you're going to be artificially pretend you're doing the insurance-based pensions, and pitiful uh, Russian experience of pension reforms. It has shown that the, let's call a spade a spade. You need so much money to be paid to pensioners with the current system's commitment. So you need to start from grassroots. But there are a lot of nuances that uh, this audience cannot actually professionally speaking about the pension reform. The concept of the pension reform was actually developed in Belarus and it actually respects all the uh, principles that are applicable for Ukraine at the moment. I don't know. Um, I'm not speaking about the pension reform that much, but uh, about your f the first part of your question. What if we start with the pension reform? 
What do we have to start with? I would actually suggest to think about the following. What do you think? What a physical territory where you can have the pension reform? Let's imagine the map of Ukraine and in which territory of Ukraine, which part of Ukraine can one make a pension reform, I mean, a normal, real pension reform following the Yaroslav's option? Let's just think, at which territory of Ukraine you can have pension reform? For example, the reform of the interior by cutting 90% of jobs with the police. Given what Vladimir just said, uh, there is very high probability that those who are going to be fired will take part in the opposition activity, or there is a concern at least about it. So what kind of territory of Ukraine can survive the judicial reform? And as a result, you're going to cut 90% of judges' jobs. And like Kaha advised once, they can be protected by Ukrainian Canadians or U.S. Canadians with legal practices abroad. So in which part of Ukraine, again, you can make this reform? Just try to, let's think together uh, in which exact territory this reform would be possible. And this is a question that is of paramount importance. So this is number one question before you start doing anything. And what we have to keep in mind is that in case you get an answer to that, or sort of answering uh, options, you'll say, oh my god, then we're not going to do it. Of course, you cannot make, you cannot find any answers like the current government does. But it means that lack of such a reform will again lead to the economic, financial, debt, crisis or default as a result of which the, there is it's going to be a political crisis a geopolitical crisis an economic catastrophe the neighbors will come in and take whatever they want to take so that and in in an outcome it's a guaranteed outcome so in the first case it's not a guarantee but probability with a chance or no chance story. And in the second case, this is a guaranteed outcome, which is the essence of what Kaha said when he mentioned that in this territory, reform will anyway take place, but they will take place either by yourself with high risks, I mean economic and political and territorial and integral, but these are the risks, but not, not guarantees. If you don't do the reform, then everything will be repetitive, but not with the risks, but it's going to be guaranteed. This is the choice one has to make. I mean, your government and all the Ukrainian society has to make. Thank you. I have a question about your suggestion to link Grimnia to the dollar, US dollar, or euro. It reminds me of Argentinian example then when in the beginning of the 90s they survived economic crisis and one of the key decisions was to link their peso to the US dollar. This really helped the, Ukrainian, uh, the, the country started doing better. But after 10 years, their major neighbors and the biggest competitor, the Brazil, oh, I mean Brazil, they devaluated their own currency, which led to even stronger and more severe crisis in Argentina or Ar Argentine because they still kept linking their foreign currency their currency to US dollar is it not going to kill the Ukrainian producers and exporters by linking hryvnia to foreign currencies to, to, to US dollar for instance because we're losing our capacity to devalu devaluate our currency. You're absolutely right. You are losing the devaluation capacity. So no central bank, no government, no prime minister, no president could decide for Ukrainian citizens whether to devaluate or not to devaluate whatever currency you take. Because currency is a measurable item to track long-term planning, expenditures, revenues, and in the devolving uh, currency when government takes millions and billions of hryvnia out of the Ukra pockets of Ukrainians. As for Argentina, you probably treated it wrong. It's not about linking hryvnia to dollar or euro. 
And this is about currency, currency border, currency management. This is a very precise system which actually emits money or securities corresponding with the available gold and foreign currency reserves. And at the same time, another big requirement is lack of budget deficit. It has to be zero budget deficit, not 15% like it is now, not, not 10, not 5, not 3, not 1, not even 0.1%. There can be a prophesied, but no deficit. Deficit. So that condition was not met in, Ar 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 in Argentine. First of all, they did, but then they said, if we're, since we were doing well, we can have also afford budget deficit already. So they started cutting the branch they were sitting on. At the end of the day, it actually collapsed, and there was no surprise. So a suggestion that was made by Yaroslav and Vladimir and myself was about, yes, as an interim decision, you can see currency bought. Either you make it without the currency board, just switch to euro, without Grivnia. I Grivnia, put your Grivnia to the National Cultural Museum and look at those papers. Some of them look really nice. And you can give you, get, go in further, like Yaroslav, to go for currency competition, not to take decision for citizens which currency to use, euro, dollar, Swiss franc, or God knows what. Maybe somebody was, will want to use Zimbabwean dollar. And there is no concern about that whatsoever. If citizens will choose. And these suggestions to make it a free competition or switching to euro for non-private currencies from abroad, this is a radical suggestion which actually solves the problem of currency monetary and, monetary and monetary stability. What about exporters? When exporters know that they have to focus on increasing the export capacity by technological means, managerial solutions, marketing tools or whatever it is, and they're quite aware that it's not worth investing in lobbying for devaluation or subsidies, then such an exporter will be much more confident in his market position, whatever market he is. I mean, internationally, given the current labor costs in Ukraine and Ukraine's cap capability to do well, to work well and ef effectively, it's just another proof. I think the exporters will have a brilliant prospect. Another suggestion that I wanted to make, to make right now it's quite fashionable in Ukraine to speak about not for federalization but decentralization. Ar in Argentina and Ukraine has been not the central gov government, but the regions that started having a lot of debts and when they uh, had so, man, so much debt that they were default that they just dropped all the debts onto the central government and it led to the major default in the whole country. So Ukraine does not have to copy-paste that experience. And that was the lion's share of the problem and a big trouble in Argentine. There, there is time for three or four questions depending on how short they are. You mentioned about the turnover tax. What do you think? What's the rate of the tax? Is, does it have to be differentiated or constant? If it's d differentiated, then what kind of sectors it will impl imply? An important remark, retail turnover, not the turnover in a whole. Companies that work without retail, they're not going to pay it. This is based purely on the principle that a tax is paid by end consumer. Can you imagine yourself in business, if you export things, you pay only one tax, for, which is an income tax, income on physical persons. Full stop. If your goods are not subject to excise duties. So an accountant can be any schoolboy. You can take, grab a calculator and just count. No differentiation has to be made because from the standpoint of taxation theory, one has to use the maximum neutral tax, which does not differentiate between uh, and no officials decides for people what is good to export, what's bad, what is socially oriented, and so on. 
So you have to purely neutral thing, one tax for all different types of products. And then the market will build natural production structure ever since. Depending on how, how much expenditure there is, all calculated in be between 10 and 15, 10 to 15 percent, either we take 20 percent of GDP, it's going to be one rate. If it's 30 percent, that's an indifferent one. This is a purely technical issue. If we just accept the principle that we're going to see how much money would be required and therefore the rate will be like that, but it has to be unanimous, uniform for all the commercial organization, regardless whether this is a privately owned, state owned, foreign capital. Capital, no foreign capital. When there is an equal mechanism, then you can turn on uh, certain mechanisms and you cannot evade from paying the tax. It's going to be a lot harder. As for euroization, so to say, the advice that you just gave, it just reminded me of one single moment when in European member states, they came to this idea like they did in England. They started refusing from, does it not do any more harm? You are calling upon the, the countries that refused from Euro. Who, who, which country? And Poland. They had Zloty during Euro. Maybe, what are you talking about? Name the name who uh, refused from Euroization after introducing Euros. UK never had Euro. The same with Sweden. Okay, probably I'm not aware of the situation. But is there any countries that switched to Euro and then it refused from Euro? The question is why these countries are not accepting euros. Why these countries like Greece, they are not happy and they think they want to re reject euros. Uh, these are rumors and Greece was in a hard crisis, financial, political crisis. And the GDP uh, decline uh, lasted for six years. It's an absolute record. But did they refuse from euros? From euro? No. They lost 30 percent of GDP from their initial level, but they did not reject euro. What about the UK? They never introduced euros. Why does it want to re introduce euro? The British pound is a num is a one of these nine uh, stable currencies, and their pound is has a very long story and it's quite stable with you with the uh, with a Deutschmark, Swiss franc, Japanese yen, and they are absolutely all right, together with a pound, and they didn't have any hyperinflation that hit Russia, Ukraine, Georgia. There are positive, negative sides, but it's uh, up to national consent. So if you have euro, it doesn't mean everyone have to switch to it. If your currency proved uh, to be efficient for many years, does Ukraine have 200 of years behind uh, of credit success behind Hrivna? We're not talking about British reforms. We're discussing what is necessary to do in Ukraine. You had a good introduction talking about savings and economy has to be should be based in saving. The question is to everyone in Ukrainian, and one small question to Vladimir. 
As you said, we, we have to work harder than the Chinese, but as far as I see it, some authorities just don't just ignore this rule. They're not working hard. And, uh, do you understand, Ukrainian? And people ignore that rule. There's a certain work period and they don't they ignore this rule and do we have to keep these people uh, in our administrations? Another question whether we should let uh, allow privatization, privatization so that the owners will control control these uh, authorities so that they would control these authorities how they work and when they work will they solve a question in the savings in educational area probably I will answer this specific question What's the point of the question? Why are we tolerating authorities who are not working? Maybe we should fire them. Well, we can put them in prison. Why should we tolerate? You, should, you can fire them. Uh, speaking about education, I think that uh, education in Ukraine is a simulacre, is a simulation. Just ask any employer, what do you think about uh, the main, most universities, they will say that you have to, it's absolutely unacceptable, unacceptable. It's, you need to cut costs from the budget, you have to privatize all specialized universities uh, who give medical workers, liars, and you have to cut costs and provide economical stimuli so that universities, they have a chance to grow and attract best professors, best students, and focus on the result and provide education that, that will be good. Maybe provide the ability to uh, for second year or third year students work. Just forget about f this fetish that Soviet education was good because it's still alive in Ukrainian mentality because la many, many universities are sources for corruption. The students paying for their exams and they think that this is the way to live. We're not talking about education, but the question was about education. Well, it's logic that is relevant to the whole public sphere. If this worker is ineffective, you have to get rid of him. But there is a confrontation to this idea that people will suffer, you have to do something with them. Why this group of people is more important than the population of the country? Giving these people chance to work, giving them job, you uh, you just don't give a chance to other people to have an effective state. Is this it? Okay, thank you. That was the last question. Let's thank each other.